I'm Erica Lukes, host of UFO Classified. For me, life isn't simply black and white. Life is full of many unknowns. It is my goal to travel the world and to work with the world's leading experts in the hopes of making groundbreaking discoveries. Join me on UFO Classified Friday nights at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, only on KCOR. Fact, fiction, or the truth, you decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Good afternoon, good evening, I'm Erica Lukes. I was happy to be here on a Friday night, and it is such a welcome relief after a day on the computer and and trying to get my business back up and, and open and everything. I hope that you and yours are safe and healthy, and we are, uh, again, getting ready for a new chapter in, in all of our lives. I know this is a complete trip, I'll tell you. Wearing a mask in public is and gloves and everything is definitely new for all of us, but I hope that you are all safe. I want to thank everybody for getting into chat, for supporting the show. I am getting uh, traction all over the world now, and people are starting to pay attention to the unfolding narrative of the Skinwalker Ranch Bigelow Aerospace Saga, and I want to encourage you to go. There's a new blog out that hit April 30th from Blue Blurry Lines called The Pentagon-Funded Paranormal Research search at Skinwalker Ranch by Kurt Collins and uh, Roger Glazelle, and I really encourage you to read that. It is at blueblurrylines.com. You can also go to Keith Basterfield's website. I'll be producing or, or putting links with regard to all of this out there so you can read this. There are people that are really digging into this and doing good research, and I appreciate their efforts because there is a whole portion of the UFO community who is so ready to believe in in what they're being spoon fed and they're looking away from the truth. Uh, you know, red herring over here and all of this distraction over there and there's something more to this and we have to look at the people that have continually been feeding the narrative decade after decade and ask really look at what their agendas are. Is this to make money? Is this to provide disinformation? Is this to, uh, you know, to stroke egos? There's so many things involved, but this is critical. And I cannot stress that this time is more important than ever for us to look at this and to make sure that we know who exactly we are getting our information from, because there is a big push to distract and steer the narrative, as you know. So anyway, with that out of the way, I feel so much better now. I am here tonight with Angela Thompson-Smith, who was Dr. Angela Thompson-Smith was born in Bristol, England. She is a wonderful lady. I had a great opportunity to speak with her the other day, and I really enjoyed that. It is refreshing to speak to a woman who has done so much and, and come up against a lot in this field. She uh, was born in Bristol, England, and attended school there until 62 when her family relocated to Dorset. Her primary qualifications were in nursing and social work, and she worked as a registered nurse and social worker in the UK. She Her initial qualifications were achieved at Poole General Hospital in Dorset, England, and Ruskin College, University of Oxford, England. She gained her BS in psychology at the University of Wales in Cardiff, an MS at the F Faculty of Medicine in Manchester University, England, and then later in the United States, her PhD in psychology at Saybrook University, California. In the U.S., Dr. Smith has worked as a medical researcher, research coordinator, and an instructor for the University of Nevada and has worked extensively as a research contractor for individuals, businesses, and organizations around the United States and abroad. 
She trained as a remote viewer with two ex-military remote viewers, Paul Smith and Lynn Buchanan, and was a founding member and director of the International Remote Viewing Association. Dr. Smith has trained hundreds of individuals in remote viewing and many other disciplines, as well as being a published author and researcher. She has written books, uh, Voices from the Cosmos, Seer, Tactical Remote Viewing. We're going to talk about that and much, much more. I am out. I'm honored to have you on here, and it was really lovely to talk to you the other day. Thank you for for accepting or wanting to to talk to me because I, I love learning from people like yourself, especially women who have been in a field for a long, long time and have important information to share. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And so, uh, you, some of my listeners are not familiar with with remote viewing and this topic and I would love it if you could be so kind as to give people a little bit of background with your your history your education and what brought you to remote viewing okay it's a long story but I'll try and <laughs> <laughs> we've got two hours we're I'll good I'll try and shorten it a little bit um well I came into remote viewing from with a natural ability um I'd had out-of-body experiences since I was a child and um I, at first I thought everybody did this you know they could go wandering off in their mind and visit places and and come back <laughs> and uh, then it was in my my late 20s I realized I learned that um, this was something not everybody did so I did a lot of personal research uh, when I came to the states um, I kind of set that all that aside for a while and um, it wasn't until around the 1980s mid 1980s that um, I started going down volunteering at two labs in Princeton because I was working in um, a little town just north of there in medical research uh, with moms and babies. Um, so I went down on my days off to PRL, which was the Psychophysical Research Labs, which is no longer around with um, uh, Chuck um, Monerton. And then after that, I went over and um, volunteered at the Pear Lab, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. And people don't really know that there was a, a sci lab at Princeton University. And I eventually ended up working there five years. And so, and, and that your and your background is so fascinating, and you you were so. Uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. I wish I had the education that that you had. And so, when when you first got involved with this, and you were working here, what? Tell us about how everything got started and how you were brought into everything. Well, it didn't really my education in remote viewing and human consciousness didn't really start until I was working at the Pear Lab. They were studying, um, they had two uh, avenues of study. One was the psychokinetic human, human machine or human computer interaction studies um, with random number generators. The other one was uh, precognitive remote perception studies where they were studying how individuals could pick up information from another individual who was out and about at a, a totally different location. Um, some of them at preset times and others um, at a time when the out, what they called the outbounder was actually at the location. And um, not only was this done at the same time, so the the viewer or the recipient and the outbounder doing their their thing at the same time. They also had the recipients, the people who were picking up the information, doing their thing days, weeks, or even months before the person at the target had even chosen or decided where they were going. And um, of course, it was all very highly uh, structured um, and uh, computerized and uh, so everything was put into the computer and um, analyzed so there was very little input for bias so the person who was doing the stats couldn't say oh well this looks like it matches here it was all um, computerized and very scientific so that was my first uh, introduction to um, remote viewing known then as remote perception and who was involved that that we would be familiar with? 
Uh, well, Bob John and Brenda Dunn were the, the head of, heads of the lab. Um, professor Robert John was uh, um, aer an aerospace professor. <clears throat> and um, then Brenda Dunn was um, the lab manager. <clears throat> but she was more than just the lab manager. I mean, she was like the heart of that place. Um, the Roger Nelson, you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. And um, then they had a whole bunch of uh, support staff, stats and engineering, etc. So I was brought in basically as a support for Brenda. Even though I had my master's at that time, um, they needed somebody to come in and um, be a supportive person. But the nice thing about the lab was everybody contributed to the, the um, experiments as well so we could we'd often say okay i've got some downtime let me go play with the random number generator or um set up a time when i could do a remote perception so it was really a hands-on job and that sounds absolutely fascinating and exciting to be involved with with all of this on the cutting edge. And so when you did uh, the remote sensing, give us a description of how that took place. And, and because I know things have evolved a bit and there are different uh, methodologies and, and ideas about this. But yeah, I would just when you were first doing this, what give, give us give us the rundown. I love hearing all these things. Okay. <laughs> well, for example, um, I had, um, there was a colleague who came to the lab and I didn't know him until he came to the lab <clears throat> and he was going out to the, um, I think it was Korea. And um, it was arranged that uh, when he was out in Korea, he would, he would find um, five targets or what we call target is a location or an event something happening and uh, I would be back in Princeton and it's five set times and days I would do my thing and try and perceive and say where is he what is he doing and there was um, a format where you first of all did some just freehand um, writing it, there was no real protocol for doing the remote perception it was just free form, whatever came into your mind. So what I did, I did my OBE thing and <laughs> I went to where he was and just described what I saw him doing, his surroundings, etc. in Korea, wrote it down. And then there was a check sheet where you could check off on a, on a scale, whether it was quiet or busy or dark, if there were animals present or not, water present or not, and it was a sliding scale um, event. So filled in that. And, um, and then there was a little confidence rating thing at the end. Now, my colleague in Korea also had the same forms. So wherever, where he was, say the first target, uh, which maybe, you know, I don't remember exactly now, but say it was an oriental bathhouse, he would describe the, the bathhouse and then he would fill out the same uh, sliding scale scoring. Is it light or dark, hot or cold, busy, quiet? Um, and, uh, and then do his uh, finish up, finish up the target. He would then send that to a third party at the lab and I would give my results to a third party at the lab and all that was then tabulated into a computer. Now eventually I got feedback, um, he would send um, photos etc of where he was but that wasn't until the very end when everything was accomplished. So the first we did the five, the first four, um, so I also went to certain locations at certain times and he was trying to <laughs> remote view where I was. Um, and um, so the same procedures. The first four, we both hit bang, bang, bang. The fifth one, we missed. Both missed. I missed his and he missed mine. And we were trying to figure out afterwards when he came back why that happened. And we figured out that it was he was actually on his way checking out of the hotel, going to the airport. So he was distracted. He wasn't very focused on the, the location. And he was moving from location to location. Um, he missed mine because that day it was my birthday. <laughs> and we were having a, a, 
a party at the lab. <laughs> oh, fun! <laughs> yes, yeah. So there was a lot of a um, lot of distraction. So we both missed it. But what he picked up in his session was um, forty days in the future from the when he should have been getting me in the lab, um, and he was picking up a conference. A parapsychology conference and he was writing all this down and going I don't know this can't be because she would have said you know or I would have he would have known at some point there was a conference going on um, but there wasn't at that time what he picked up was he jumped he time jumped and he went to a conference the SSE conference that took place 40 days after when we were doing our sessions and um, to the to the nth degree, he picked up the conference, the speakers, who was sitting in certain seats where I was sitting, etc. And uh, pretty amazing stuff. And so, can you give our our listeners just a little bit of background on SSE? Because I have a feeling that some people new to this don't understand uh, about yeah. the organization. Yeah, it's um, a um, scientific organization organization is the Society for Scientific Exploration <clears throat> and it's a group, a large, very large group of scientists who also have an interest in other things such as UFOs, uh, parapsychology, human consciousness, alternative healing, alternative energy, etc. And they have a conference. Some, they, they, used to have it every year. I'm not sure if that's the case now. Um, and when I worked at PEAR, I was very involved in um, set, helping to set up these conferences. So um, that is still around. SSE is still, they have a wonderful journal that they put out and hold conferences. And it's really um, held on a very scientific basis. So they look at anomalies and other things from a very scientific uh, viewpoint. They do, and I—I I was a member. I've—I've I've, I've let that lapse, uh, but there, I was fascinating. I know I hate to say that, but it—it it is yeah. always very fascinating. And and Dr. John Alexander is uh, a frequent contributor to SSC. Yes, yeah, he's—he's he's actually in Las Vegas. Lives in Las Vegas. Yes, that's interesting. Las Vegas seems to be the the action spot <laughs> for, a, for a lot of things. It's very, very interesting. But I, you know, with with regard to all of this research, did you ever, you know, at that point in time, were you ever, did you ever feel that perhaps the intelligence community could be involved in any of the research or would oh, have an absolutely. interest? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, when I, the five years I was at the lab, everybody and their sister and brother came through that lab. And um, from, I, I can't name names or organizations or agencies or, <laughs> you know, but um, it absolutely um, very, um, very prominent presence in the, um, and particularly in SSE. You find a lot of people, a lot of um, government folks attend those conferences. Um, but they were as eager and as curious as the public, <laughs> you know, because we were actually doing the research. And, and it is interesting to see how this just kind of overlaps and there are people that cross both boundaries and, and you know, both live in. And, and so that thank you for, for talking a little bit about that. Did, were you aware of other countries or governments that might have been interested too when you were there doing your research? Not so much with the lab itself, but the people that came by. For example, a colleague of mine, C.B. Scott Jones. Um, he had been over to Russia and China and um, had uh, investigated parapsychology, UFOs, um, a lot of the paranormal topics that were actually taking place in China at that time. And um, of course, he, he told us you know, about some of the work. We also had a Russian um, scientist as a guest at the lab um, for about a year. And uh, we also had visitors from Russia who came and gave us talks about their paranormal work in Russia. 
So, and that is really, I mean, that is, it's, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that because this is, is very fascinating and I think it's important uh, to, to stress. And I want to just throw this in here because I find this very interesting. Um, your your colleague and co-author of your book, his father was Colonel Joseph Bryan with the United States Air Force. And he uh, was also, he, he weaved his way in and out of NICAP, you know, and uh, he was. Uh, he was a, with the CIA and was a psychological warfare expert, which I find, and he was on the NICAP Board of Governors, which is very interesting. Yeah, you're talking about Scott. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In fact, in Voices from the Cosmos, Scott, um, the first couple of chapters, Scott was has been very open with his background. And he's written a lot of several chapters on his work in India and in China and um, makes no secret of the fact that he was a di so-called diplomat. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and, and so I mean, I'm, excuse me if I'm, I'm confused. It doesn't take much this evening. I'm telling you, but is but his father was uh, was the colonel, right? And then is Scott your co-author? I don't know about um, well, C.B. Scott Jones is the only person I know. I never knew of his father. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that's something I'm glad that I'm thinking clearly tonight. But yes, his father was was uh, with. He was a colonel, and then he was. The, which I find fascinating. He was in NICAP and eventually started kind of poo-pooing NICAP and NICAP eventually dissolved in the 70s. But it is interesting to, to note that, that his father was on the board of governors. That's interesting. And isn't yeah. that interesting? It was a psychological warfare expert. It's like, yeah, it's so, I didn't know that. I yeah. know. I know. <laughs> I, I, these little connections I'm making and I just sit back and it's like, wow, this is, this is, it gets mm -hmm. trippier by the moment, as you know. <laughs> It's just, it, yes, and it's very, yeah. it seems like a big circle, but it really is quite small when you start looking at all the people that have been involved in this over the decades. And I, I love that, but I, I really appreciate this. I know this is going to be a great conversation. You've got a lot to offer, a lot of wonderful experiences. And is there is there a great website? What's the best website for people to find out more about you and to get your books? I know they're on Amazon, but are they on your website? Um, I don't sell them on the website, but I do have some information there. My website is fairly rudimentary, <laughs> and that is um, mindwiseconsulting.com. I like it. I like it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just want to give a shout out to all of my friends in, in the, the chat room tonight. You, I love your lively discussions. We all have different political viewpoints on, on many things. And, and I know that at the end of the day, we can all respectfully disagree, but you are, I you really appreciate you. And I want to, to just give a shout out to Northern UFOs who has been so helpful and supportive of UFO classified over the years. I couldn't do it without you. This is a listener supported show. I appreciate all of the contributions. It means the world to me. I really feel like I said in the intro that now more than ever, we have to be diligent. We have to do our work. We have to really be mindful in different social media groups that we are being played, manipulated, and all sorts of things. So do your homework. Thanks for supporting the show. We're going to take a break and we will be back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. <laughs> Do you want the story behind the story? Then tune in Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern for Paranormal Rewind. Enter a world of the twisted and deformed. The mics are hot as author Sam Baltrusis and paranormal tech guru Keith Bailey take you behind the scenes with Paranormal Rewind. Paranormal Rewind. A show that transports you back in time and re-examines featured TV shows, radio broadcasts, and books that made the paranormal what it is today. Sound good? This mind-bending, as well as engaging, one-hour show will feature some of the best para-celebrities, investigators, and authors from around the world. It's okay. 
There's nothing wrong with that. Come visit Paranormal Pop Culture's most terrifying and memorable cases today. Paranormal Rewind, Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. In the shadows, a voice cries out. Evidence that you're not alone. You said my name. What is your name? Proof that the living and the dead coexist. Or do they? Every Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, join writer, producer, and paranormal investigator Greg Bakken on Ghost Box Radio as he explores, interviews, and investigates evidence alongside some of the best in the paranormal community and beyond. Six people killed. Ghost Box Radio, Wednesday nights exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Because the dead don't sleep. Ghost Box Radio. If ever a breed was affectionate to a fault, it's the Golden Retriever. They're people dogs, pure and simple. And the Golden Retriever Rescue of Southern Nevada needs your help. If you would like to volunteer, foster, adopt, or donate, go to the Golden Retriever Rescue of Southern Nevada's website at grrsn.org. That's grrsn.org. Or call 598-GOLD. That's 598-G-O-L-D. KCOR Las Vegas. All the time. Of course I listen. I listen all day. It's the best music. KCOR, the new underground source for news, talk, and music at KCORradio.com. Tell your friends. Email them or Facebook them or Twitter them. Hey, are we done here? Because I'm losing my buzz. Here we go, world. You're listening to the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Broadcasting from the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada. Your base is so large, it has to draw most of its power from a nearby nuclear fusion plant. The future of radio is here and now. You're listening to... You're listening to... You're listening to... UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name, KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. You can find my website at ufoclassified.com. There's also ericalukes.com, but I don't have enough time in the day to keep up with that. I don't even know why I told you, but hey, there you go. I am also on Facebook. Um, I tweet every once in a while. There's just, you know, the social media. Let me tell you, never a dull moment there. But I want to just thank everybody. Again, I, I mentioned this. This is you. You're the reason that I'm here. And I spend hours and hours and hours a week researching things, making connections. Uh, if you were to see my files, you it wouldn't I guess it wouldn't surprise any of you, but I really feel that this is an important topic. I feel that there are many, many good people that come into this who have had profound experiences that are looking for answers. And I also feel, as I stressed uh, on the show in the beginning, that we have to do our due diligence and we have to understand that there is a need to steer the narrative and there is a need to make sure people don't have all the information. And I think we can look at that with regard to some of the remote viewing and uh, things over the, the the history of remote viewing and some of the different people that were involved. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these, these things with my guest tonight, Dr. Angela Thompson-Smith. And I appreciate her for being here. She's a lovely woman. I'm so happy that I reached out to her. She reached out to me as well. It was a mutual thing. 
But there's so much to talk about. And we were talking about how she got started with this, the remote viewing and and some of the the protocols that were used. And then also uh, the people that were Russian scientists that were visiting the labs and very interested in paranormal topics. And so thank you and welcome back to the show. I, I just is lovely to have you here thank tonight. You. Absolutely. And I, I, so with, with regard to some of the people that were coming in and out of the lab, when specifically did you get introduced to Dr. Hal Putoff? Um, through SSE through the Society for Scientific Exploration. Um, uh, so I, I knew him back in the late 1980s uh, before I actually met him in the remote viewing capacity. Uh, so, um, and just an amazing, amazing man. You know, for all the, all the people in the anomalous field, he is one of the people that I really trust. And... Um, you know, I I feel that he's he's really got his feet he's got his feet on the ground so he can have his head in the clouds. You know, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, and then I didn't get to know um, Paul Smith until. Can I give you how I segued oh, yes, from yes, yes. Pear and got into the field of actual remote viewing? Yes, I would love that. What was called now called remote viewing. Um, well, I knew about remote viewing back in England um, in the in 1980 before I emigrated to the States. I had sent off for a reprint of Russell Targ's and Hal Putoff's uh, scientific paper in the IEEE about their work at Stanford Research Institute in remote viewing. And it intrigued me. Um, and then when I came over to the States, I, I was in New Jersey and um, got got some of the books and um, never realizing at that time that I would be involved in the field. <laughs> it was at that time just a fascinating interest. Um, and um, when I actually went down to Pear, that's when I started meeting some of the folks in the the. Um, the people who'd worked at Stanford Research Institute and some of the people from the military remote viewing unit, which was um, later termed Stargate, and it's now commonly known as as Stargate. Um, And with Paul Smith, who was actually my trainer, um, I knew about Paul back at the lab because he would send for reprints, etc. And... um, so I didn't know him personally then, but um, in 1992, my my job responsibilities were finishing up at the lab and um, to do with funding. And um, I segued then over into Las Vegas and um, I, I met somebody there, David Smith, <laughs> and started dating David Smith. And I was telling David, it's a small world. It is. I was telling David about what I did at the Pear Lab. He said, well, my brother does something like that in the military. I was like, okay, what's your brother's name? It's Paul Smith. And he's very involved in um, what's called remote viewing. So I said, okay. Okay. So because... It, when I came, let me backtrack a little bit. When I came out to to Las Vegas, I was working as a research coordinator for Robert Bigelow, and I did that for almost two years. So I was one day in my office there, um, on the phone to um, Ed Dames, who was another of the Stargate military remote viewers, and I said, because uh, I'd done a little bit of remote viewing consulting for Ed, I said, Ed, do you know somebody called Paul Smith? He said, I might. <laughs> and I said, well, I think I'm dating uh, his brother, David. And he said, no. He said, no. <laughs> but he checked with Paul and Paul said, yes, that's true. You know, so eventually over around 1996, 97, um, I also I actually became one of Paul's um, students in remote viewing and that's where I got my formal remote viewing training from Paul Smith and then after that I also went and got some training with Lynn Buchanan who was also one of the Stargate remote viewers. 
And that, that whole thing is fascinating. And again, it's such a small world and it, it's amazing. And when we had our conversation uh, the other day, it was it was funny to hear how you made that connection and, and my connection with Skinwalker Ranch and, mm-hmm. and meeting Chris Marks and, and things. You just never know how how things will play out. But it is it's quite right. interesting. Right. <laughs> And, and so I want to go back because this this is fascinates me. But you know, Robert Bigelow is a, f- a fascinating and, and controversial character, and I would love to know more about how you first he first reached out to you, and then what took place for you to to go become the research coordinator. Well, when I was still back at Pear, and um, I knew there was a parting of the ways, and uh, I would have to start looking for another post. Um, one of my, I was doing my PhD through Saybrook University at that time, and Professor Stanley Krippner was one of my teachers there. And um, I had written out a lot of different letters to different folks, um, you know, just sending out um, inquiries, basically. And uh, so Stanley knew somebody who knew Robert Bigelow. <laughs> Again, it's a small world. And uh Robert Bigelow was looking for um, somebody to be a scientific uh, coordinator for him. And uh, so the first I heard of him was from a telephone call that he had to Brenda and uh, at the lab, Brenda Dunn. And she told me that there's, you know, somebody who's sort of looking for you if you, you want to uh, have a job. So my interview actually was when I was out in California for school with Saybrook. Um, I was out doing, you know, a couple of times a year to to California, to San Francisco. And I was at a school party and this gentleman comes up to me and says, hey, I am a coordinator for... um, you know, he didn't actually say he was where he was from. He said he was a headhunter, which I don't think he was. He said, let's go and sit out on the steps and I'll tell you about this job that's available. So we said, that's the, the weirdest job interview I've ever had. You know, <laughs> sitting on the steps outside of a dance, answering all these questions about <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. But And then I actually um, came out to Las Vegas in the um, the summer of 92 and um, the Parapsychological Association was having a conference. So I was invited out to that and that's where I met Robert, Robert Bigelow at that conference. And uh, of course he showed me around, you know, the headquarters and uh, some ideas that he had and... Um, what was really funny was because people learned that I was going to go work for Robert Bigelow, I became like the blue, uh, the golden haired person that they could all come up to and say, um, do you think you could talk to him about our project? We're looking for some funding. <laughs> you know, People who wouldn't have given me the time of day before. Now I was their best friend, which I found very amusing. <laughs> so um, I moved out here to Las Vegas in ni- the fall of 92 um, not expecting I thought what am I doing going out to Las Vegas but it was an adventure it was something new and um, it turned out to be a really good uh, a good move I, I bet it was and then you've been in, in Nevada ever since and so you know with with your work with Bigelow and the research research coordinator, I, I've listened to an interview that you had done and you had mentioned that Bigelow wanted to build a device to detect UFOs. Yes. And my, my uh, David, David Smith actually took on that project and um, he was basing it on some research that Hal Puthoff had done because Hal and colleagues would go out to the desert and get readings from these craft and there's a certain frequency that they use that is has been published. And I think I actually put it in, it's probably in um, Diary of an Abduction, another book that I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, so they, what Robert Bigelow wanted to do, he wanted to base it on semaphore or, you know, the um, dots and dashes. But um, I think David actually tuned it to the frequency that uh, Hal put off 
had uh, done. I don't know if it was ever used or not. And, and that is it's so interesting. I, that's that is fascinating. And how much, you know, when, when you were interacting with Bigelow, what kind of, what was, what were your impressions of him? Because you hear so many different things things about him and I think he has this uh he's he's kind of like the great Oz you know it's like he's got so many things built up around him and like you were saying people are so enamored with him that people uh think that he's you know you were the golden golden child because you were associated with him and I think a lot of people feel that way and they want to to talk to him and get get to know him and what I mean but he's he's a very interesting fellow so what what were your initial thoughts? My, my perceptions were this is a highly intelligent man, incredibly creative, but with maybe a little bit of a short attention span <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, which happens with very highly intelligent, highly creative people. They, they, they're interested here, then they're interested here. And um, when he would come into the office, he'd come and sit in my office for a while and start telling me his ideas you know kind of downloading and he would jump from um co you know concept to concept and I had to fight you know sort of catch up I go okay he's on to something different now <laughs> um so uh but a very fascinating um individual very um not I'm not going to say stubborn because that's the wrong focused, very focused person. Because once he got an idea, he ran with it. And um, I was there pre the uh, the NIDS group. I was pre the um, consciousness lab at UNLV, um, as I was there just for a time period. And um, but again, I met a, a lot of people that I also knew from SSE. Uh, that came through to talk with Mr. Bigelow and um, get to know some of his, uh, you know, some of the projects that he would he would like to fund. And he did fund a lot. He funded some of the crop circles research and um, a lot of the folks out there in the UFO field. And, of course, MUFON. He was very involved with MUFON. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just uh, what... When I left the, the um, you know, his employ, I didn't have any contact with him for oh, a decade or more. But then uh, when I, f was it two years ago, uh, I went to an, a joint SSE and IRVA remote viewing conference and we were invited as a group out to his um, aerospace lab in North Las Vegas on a tour, which was Fascinating. So we had to be, pre, you know, sort of vetted before we went, and we had to be citizens and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then when we first went into the cafeteria, and then remember, this is like um, from 2000 and um, let's see, 1995, uh, four or five, up to just two years ago. I hadn't had any connection with him, and um, people were lining up to go shake his hand and talk to him. And I thought, should I go up and say hi? I thought, yeah, why not? So I got in line. When I got up there, he looked at me and I said, do you remember me? He said, Angela Thompson, because I hadn't married David Smith at that time. Yes. And he caught hold of, with both hands, my hands, and just held them. And it was like, yes, I remember you, <laughs> you know. And it was really nice to reconnect. Um because I, you know, it had been such a long time. Well, he is, he, you know, and that's the the thing that, that Chris, uh, my husband, had said because he worked w with him and and around him all the time. And he, would, my husband, was actually there, the only other person there when he did the sixty minutes interview, uh -huh. which I think is 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 fascinating. But he definitely, you know, I mean, it was was very uh, kind. Uh, to Chris, and he was very, he's a very interesting, he is a kind en person, en kind enigmatic uh, yeah. <laughs> person, and and so, and I, I, he has a lot of, uh, you know, he's got a good PR team around him, so they they kind of build up the myth of of, <laughs> yes, <laughs> of Bigelow, yeah. and, and it is quite, it's it is it's it's, it's interesting to see. Um, he has always reminded me of Tesla, 
similar kind of personality. Um, so I, I'm hoping that's a compliment, <laughs> and I'm saying that as a compliment. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's interesting, you know. And I I know that I gave you a little a bit of the story about what Chris has been and his colleagues have been been questioning about what happened at Skinwalker Ranch, mm-hmm. and that narrative, and that that is interesting, and that brings up a whole a whole new thing, and and the remote viewing that you did back in the day. <laughs> Back in the yeah. 90s, and I, I would love to talk a little bit more about that because I think that is when I read when I read the report that was absolutely fascinating to me, and I know that it was mentioned in Hunt for the Skinwalker, the the book by George Knapp and Colm Kelleher. But there's much more to that, and I, I think that some of this could really be relevant to what we're finding out now. And so Mm -hmm. that'll be very curious. And so I want to, before I get sidetracked and before we go to break with, since you were involved with all of this in the pre-NIDS days, who was involved in Bigelow's world in the pre-NIDS days that was involved with NIDS? Um, Of course, John Alexander and um, Hal Putoff and some of the other folks I never got to meet. So, um, you know, there were there was a, a group about eight or nine folks. Um, the two main ones, as I say, were John Alexander and Hal Putoff, because I, I knew them them pretty well. Did you ever meet? Yeah, I'm sure. You, did you meet Kit Green, Doctor Kit Green, at all? Only at one of the remote viewing conferences, but not to speak to personally. I'd n- never met him in a professional capacity. Oh, interesting. There's so many people, again, you know, just like Bigelow, who are so enigmatic, and, and they, they come in and out of of, of this, and you, you hear different things, and you're not sure which way to go with all of that. And like uh, uh, Pan, Ron Pandolfi, again, is another person who was involved, I think, with with NIDS at, at the very beginning. and then Yeah, you know, I never met him, no. It's so interesting. I, I love all of this, and thank you for for humoring me and letting me talk about this. And so, when what other types of things with as far as doing the research coordination for for Bigelow? What other types of things were you involved with? With that? one of my main jobs was fielding um, inquiries. Um, so that was sort of a day-to-day thing, um, assembling a library, ascend- assembling a, um, a database of reprints and projects. So I was very much in an office. Um, but um, there were also, we also had a radio program. Now, very few people know this, and I'll tell you quick, because I know we're coming up to the, the, the hour. Um, we had um, John Alexander and a few other folks um, you know, um, Linda Morton Howe and George Knapp and, um, oh gosh, the guy who had Coast to Coast first. Anyway, so uh, B- yes, Bigelow oh had gosh, the idea. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Bigelow had the idea that he wanted to run a radio show. So in the summer of 93, in the June of 93, we started um, and it was run out of um, Perump and um it was called Area 2000, and it ran for six months. And um, every two weeks, we had a, a new um, person coming on to talk about all sorts of things under the sun, UFOs, parapsychology, etc. And it was um, what my job was was to find um, people to be interviewed, um, find news for Linda Moulton Howe and George Knapp to read on the air, um, multiple things. But at the end of the six months, I think that something had happened um, with Mr. Bigelow that he lost interest in the radio show and he closed it down because he was on to something else. <laughs> but it was fascinating for the six months. And then um, it went on then to become Coast to Coast and it was out of Bigelow's hands then. And that is really interesting to see some of the the key players that have been involved in in ufology and 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 things and and what what sorts of topics and you mentioned when we were talking about the very first show that happened on Area Two Thousand and just really quickly before we go to break, tell us a bit about that. Well, that was John Alexander, and he was talking um, about um, his general interests, the UFOs, 
uh, non-lethal weaponry, I mean, everything, you know, that he was involved in at that time. And um, so it was sort of a, an, over an, an upper hour and a half, I believe, I, maybe even two hours. And um, so, and I remember that very first one because it was July 4th and um, I went to a fireworks display and I wore, um, I had my little radio with me and my headphones and I listened to the show while we were watching fireworks. I bet that was exciting. And, yes. and, and how, I always think it's fascinating how somebody could uh, bring in or, or put non-lethal weapons and UFOs in the same sentence. Well, but Alex, talking, if anybody yeah. Alexander could, that it would be that would be him. Yeah, it was Art Bell. That was it. It was yes, Art, Art Bell, Bell who was the, um, the ran the show. It was the interviewer. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And what? And you obviously you worked with uh, Linda Moulton Howe a bit, and we'll have to talk a little bit about that. But we've got actually two minutes before break. But what what types of things did you work on with her? Well, her role in um, Area 2000 was reading um, on, on every show. She had a, a segment where she talked about interesting stuff that was happening out in the ET UFO world. And my job was to find um, new snippets, um, information for her. So I went on the um you know, all the news breaks, it wasn't as elaborate as it is today. Today, you can go and find anything. There, I had to search through some of the, um, you know, the, the boards and um, see what was happening out there. And people called us up, too, and told us, you know, well, there's something happening out in California, something happening out in Fife, Alabama. So, I, I gave her all that information information, which she then read on the, um, the show. And all the same with George Knapp. Well, I wish that I had somebody like you doing that for me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be really wonderful. I would be so happy. Oh my gosh, so you, I bet you were amazing at that. And that would, you know, when we were talking, it, it, we mentioned trying to find original recordings of that, which was something that we will have to do. I think that would be absolutely fascinating to hear that and kind of see where all of this got its start with with the same group of people that we now see that are very very prevalent. It's fascinating, and I want to just. Again, thank you for being on the show. I knew this was going to be a really wonderful conversation. I am Erica Lukes here with Dr. Angela Thompson Smith. You can check out her books, uh, Voices from the Cosmos, here, Tactical Remote Viewing. You can get them on Amazon. We're going to take our longer of the two breaks, and we will be back. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, Visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the saucer. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO, and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left, and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified. 
Erica Lukes. Welcome back to the second half of UFO Classified. You can find my website at ufoclassified.com. Please uh, share information about the show. Get things out to the public. I appreciate all of your support and your help and all the people that contribute to keep the show on the air. Thank you so much. I know right now all of all of us are going through really an unprecedented time and it means the world to me that you would keep supporting the show and I as I always say I do this for you for us because this is an important topic and we deserve the best we deserve good information and it is very very difficult to weed through some of the information that we're bombarded with especially right at the moment so anyway thank you i am here with dr angela thompson smith who was born in bristol england she has worked over the years with the remote viewing she has written many books which we're going to talk a little bit about because they are fascinating and she also had the pleasure of 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 working uh, with Robert Bigelow back before the NIDS days. And there was also a great remote viewing uh, that was done on Skinwalker Ranch, which we're going to talk a little bit about. But Angela, I'm just, I'm looking at my notes from tonight's show and there's so many things, so many areas that we, directions we could go. And when we left off, we were talking about Area 2000 and how that was started by by Bigelow and Al, John Alexander was involved, and then you had Linda Moulton Howe, and 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 the the program only lasted for six months. We definitely need to get try to find that and get a hold of it. But it really was kind of it was the the starting point for uh, Midnight in the Desert and Coast to Coast AM and all of these things. And it's it, that was just just amazing to me. No, most people don't know about that. Right, and I bet there, well, there were multiple sets of tapes made for each show. So I'm sure that out there, there are tapes available. We'll have to Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere, we'll find them. Somewhere. Be, I know, yeah. I hope we can find them. And so when you were, and I also, when I was listening to another interview of you, you mentioned going on an investigation that had to do with cattle mutilations. Right. <laughs> So tell us about that. <clears throat> well, that was what Mr. Bigelow sent me out there. Um, and uh, I went out to um, Lake Gunderson. I stayed in a motel there. And um, my instructions were to, first of all, find people out there who, because it was supposedly a hotbed of UFO sightings and contact, etc. So I was going out just free form and contacting all these people um, who had these amazing stories. And um, the other thing was um, I was instructed to go find this policeman um, who was um, with the Fife uh, Police Department. He was actually the policeman because <laughs> it was such a tiny community. And um, he was very involved with <clears throat> and studying the local um, cattle mutilations which were um, ongoing in many, many locations, not just uh, Fife or Skinwalker. Um, and this was back in the 19, early 1990s. And uh, so I went out with um, some colleagues that I met there in Alabama. And um, first of all, he was, you know, um, I honestly cannot remember his name right now. It will come to me. <laughs> Uh, a real sweet guy and he said well who are you and what do you want and he said I'm the policeman here have you got a problem he said, no no I've come out to talk to you about the mutilate cattle mutilations oh come on in <laughs> and he had and he was on duty but he showed us all of his scrapbooks um, all of the reports that had been made about the cattle mutilations um, and uh, amazing stuff and um I think he was there for a couple of years and then he decided he wanted to move on uh, somewhere else. Uh, but he was very, very open uh, with all of the uh, research that he was doing. And so one of my uh, my show supporters and somebody who's been on my show before, uh, RJ Mufo, UFO Watchdog, is, is just mentioning that his Ted Oliphant. Yes, that's him. Yeah. But he, he likes to be kind of low-key, so. Uh. 
So we won't, we'll just mention the name once and then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. was there any, with regard to the cattle mutilations, because we've heard so many different things over the years, and I think that there was a, uh, you know, obviously the the steer was this was extraterrestrial and i think we've heard more and more people do really good research with you know and and looking at at logic and and saying that they actually probably weren't that this was something that was was man-made what were your thoughts when you were dealing with that that's one of the areas that uh, mr bigelow and i um differed on because we would sit and talk about these things and i had found some research um, that um, was showing new laser research. Um, and, um, you know, my feeling was that there was some um, human connection. And he was adamant that it was not. It was absolutely ET related. My feeling now is it's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you know, that's a lot with a lot of truth is you've got the extreme views and then somewhere in the middle is the truth. And I think that's really important because you do get the the extreme views, which I think are honestly purposefully put there to kind of distract away from what could be happening with regard to things. And and it is interesting to note with, you know, the cattle mutilations. I mean, they're happening in specific areas. Could certain factions or certain, you know, the government be testing things and, and not I don't know. There's there's so much to to look at with regard to that. But the, I want to because this is going to take up a bit of time, and this is something. Well, I did you- write all of this up um, in one of my books. It's out of print at the moment. A diary of an abduction, but I'm going to um, re. Well, I'm going to cannibalize it this summer and mm-hmm. take out certain parts and add new stuff in. Um, right up because that was published in 2001 so it's going to be 20 years of stuff that I've learned since it's going to go into a new book and um, I'm not quite sure what the title is going to be yet but um, that's that'll probably be out in the summer I can't wait we'll have to have you on multiple times just because I enjoy talking to you and it's so wonderful to talk to a, a a woman, an intelligent woman, and somebody that's been through through so much in in the field. And tell us a little bit about before I ask you about the remote view that, that was done on Skinwalker Ranch. Mm-hmm. But tell us a little bit more about your book and about the twenty years of research and some of the things that you have learned. Right. Well, I've written quite a few books. I'll just run them off real quick. (laughs) Uh, My first book was Remote Perceptions, uh, which was from um, really talking about my OBEs and about the early days of um, remote viewing. And that is now on Amazon, only in Kindle, because it's just so difficult to get a book that's previously being published and kind of rehash it for um, paperback again. Um, So there was that then there was diary of an abduction and both of those were originally published by hampton roads out in uh, virginia so um so those were the two then i wrote two by autobiographical books um a historical novel called um uh, river of passion and then a little autobiographical book called shire that i recently updated both of those are on um, amazon um then i wrote um with Scott Jones as a co-author, we wrote uh, Voices from the Cosmos, and that was based on some research I did for a client where he asked me, can you talk to the aliens? So we spent a year interviewing different alien groups <laughs> using remote viewing, um, which was fascinating. Um, so all of that is in um, Voices from Voices of, from the Cosmos. Um, after that, I decided I would start documenting cases, 30 years of remote viewing um, cases from up to 2013, which is called SEER, S-E-E-R. And I'm now writing a sequel to that called Scribe, which takes the, um, the cases up to 2020. So that's what I'm currently working on. That should be out very soon. Um, I've got the material, I just need to format it for Amazon. Um, And then the other one I had was tactical remote viewing, which was um, I worked for nine years for a New York businessman as his remote viewer. 
I was even on retainer with him for the last couple of years. <clears throat> and we did everything from basic business remote viewing to his personal interests, which were UFOs, ETs, alternative health, um, historical enigmas, and all of that now. Or I couldn't write about everything because I signed some non disclosures but um, the bulk of the work is now in tactical remote viewing that's all, all of these are on Amazon and then I just for fun I wrote a little book called uh, Columbia Quest which was about um, the years I worked as a volunteer down in South America in the 1970s I worked with at an orphanage so you know that was just a fun thing I did um, in between <laughs> so in a nutshell and, you're, and, and your life is just it's so Fascinating. And uh, you've met so many colorful people and you've been into all of these. You've, you've just, I, I hope that my life can be as, as exciting as I've yours. I've had an interesting life, yes. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> and so what are some of the things that have really, that, you know, when you first got into all of this, how, how have your feelings or beliefs changed? Or have um, they? When I first got into, say, the remote viewing field, I saw there was a question there about my thoughts on remote viewing now. And it wasn't until I actually did a project in the late 1980s, or, you know, it was probably, or in 1990, I think it was, for Ed Dames, for SciTech, as a consultant. And then this was looking for the plane, the downed plane of Saint Exupery in south, uh, south of France. Um, he was the author of The Little Prince. Um, and when I finally got the written report and I was reading it along with my work in there too, and it was like, wow, this stuff works. Remote viewing really works. <laughs> so that was my first confirmation that there really was something to remote viewing, even though I knew about the remote perception work at Pair. Putting remote viewing to work is my passion. And um, that report from Ed Dames was just an amazing um, evidence that this was this had some reality. And since then, I've done everything from remote viewing the rings of Saturn to the, um, you know, the microscopic levels of the, the atom to um, everything under the sun. And I know this stuff works. And so what are the different types of remote viewing? Because I think this can often be confusing for people and it would be great to get clarification yeah, and it depends who you talk to in the field at what right. level they've entered into the field. Um, originally, of course, it was um, coordinate remote viewing. So remote viewers were just given a latitude, longitude, and uh, you know, Ingo Swan and Pat Price. And then they just went there um, freeform and just saw what was there. Then they got it. They said, well, you know, they could, uh, the viewer could memorize all the latitudes and longitudes. So they encrypted those in the computer and gave them an alphanumeric like ABC123. And the viewer still got the target. So that was pretty amazing. Then they decided when the military became interested. Oh, and then they had the outbounder technique where somebody or group would go out into the community and the remote viewer would try to remote view where they were. So those were the three early ones. Then when the military became interested, um, Ingo Swan and Hal Putoff developed a protocol called controlled remote viewing, which I've worked with and I was trained by Paul and Lynn Buchanan. And that is a sequential written and spoken protocol that's very, very um, precise. So some people who are very more free form um, don't like it. But I found it was like being given an organizer that I could um, sit down with a um, stack of white paper and a pen and just go through the protocol. And you don't even have to think about the data. The data just comes in because you're probing for it with every written stage. Um, with As different people came, left the unit, the remote viewing unit, and went out to the community and started teaching, it developed 
different names. So instead of coordinate remote viewing, it became technical remote viewing and scientific remote viewing, etc. But they're all based on the same protocol. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it, the one thing that I have noticed uh, with all of this is there's there, there appears to be, you know, just like every different type of, of faction or thing, there there is a bit of ego involved. In, of course. In, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, you've got, yeah, it, it, that's, it, that's been very interesting to watch and to read about the somebody putting this faction down or somebody doing a b c and d and it seems like it is mm-hmm. it's, it's really you know and that's the way that's that's life that's what happens it happens yeah there's territory yeah. and there's yeah. ego and yeah and and as a woman you know we've got a few minutes before break and i want to and then we'll in the next uh next last segment we'll talk about the remote viewing for skinwalker ranch but i, I want to talk a little bit about some of the the things that you have faced as as a woman in this field because we talked about that and I really appreciated your your comments that you have made on social media uh, lately because we just there aren't enough women involved in this and and if there are we certainly in in some regards take a back seat to the men in the subject in different subjects and so tell us a little bit about your your thoughts on 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 that and some of the experiences you've had. When I got into the formal remote viewing um, field and um, a little bit before I was on the um, the IRVA um, board, um, I had people that were complaining that I was riding Paul Smith's coattails, being his sister-in-law, because I married his brother eventually. <laughs> um, and... Um, you know, I was not respected. Oh, and with Lynn Buchanan, too, they were like, oh, you're just riding on the, you know, these guys' coattails um, and not giving me my own right and, and presence in the field. Um, it was very um, validating when I was included with the group, with the with all of these guys um, to go out in... in um, 99 to um, in was it uh, Alamogordo, where we set up the International Remote Viewing Association. So I was I was part I was the only woman on that. Um, and some people said, "Oh, well, you were the token woman." You know, no, no, I was there <laughs> Valid, <laughs> validly, <laughs> <laughs> and that really I think helped establish my my place or the beginning of my place in the remote viewing field. And, and I've and, proven, and, and proven myself since. <laughs> you absolutely, absolutely, and I think it is it is interesting. And, and I kind of had a, a very similar experience in in the UFO world. I mean, it was people, and I I could name names, but I won't. But people that would mm-hmm. surprise people listening that you know it was just oh oh well she's just a you know a pretty face or she's just a you know da 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 and very. Um, sexist and demeaning and there have been lots of you know people use that to to demean people and discourage people women from strong women intelligent women from getting involved in these subjects and i think especially in ufology it is is a male dominated field and so when a woman like as you absolutely and so when when somebody comes in that definitely threatens the narrative and it is interesting to to see on different tv shows Shows that there are a lot of male-dominated shows that don't necessarily include women, and when they include women, it's it's always the the secretary or you know the the yeah. enthusiast, uh, little bubbly enthusiast, or or the person that is like you were mentioning, somebody that is out there, you know, lighting incense and and chanting in the woods and different right. things, <laughs> and so. <laughs> Yeah. And so there are these, these <laughs> stereotypes that, that are unfortunately portrayed and some of the networks kind of glom yeah. on to yeah. those and that that is is not not helpful. But just, you know, again, before we go to break, just give us a few more thoughts on that and maybe some encouragement well, for, for women that want to get involved. Yeah, I would say keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, fortunately, I'm very stubborn. And when people say to me, oh, you can't do that, I say, watch me. 
<laughs> um, and I've my thing is just don't give up. Just keep going through um, one step after the other and do your own thing regardless of what everybody else says. Um, I mean, I listen if there was some absolute danger or problem. But, um, you know, I found my own place. Find your niche in the in the field. And I think that is really important because there is it's we need some we need some a fresh perspective and we need to kind of let the the good old boys club which has dominated I think a lot of different fields <laughs> you know we need to yeah let, let that go get some new ideas and really support and promote women and also uh, understand that there is uh, a lot of there is sexual harassment and and uh, abuse that takes place in these different topics and we need to be mindful especially in in a subject like ufology where there is no you know this is this is like the wild west there are no ethics or you know morals and things and so people can get away with a lot of of bad behavior and it's unfortunate for for young women uh, that are getting into this topic because we need young women in this field. Mm -hmm. I haven't experienced that, to be quite honest. Um, but there again, you know, um, I try and remain as professional as I can. Um, and um, just stick with it. <laughs> Yes, that's excellent advice because, I, yeah, and I, and unfortunately I have, and so I'm kind of speaking a little bit from personal experience there, but it, um, it is, it, it is worthy of pursuing and it, there are good people out there that we can turn to. And, and I, I was so happy to connect with you because you've been through so much and you've accomplished so many things so it is really wonderful to have to have uh to have you in my life and to have you on the show and to have you inspire a younger generation and women that want to get involved in the topic so i really oh, appreciate you. that absolutely absolutely and i am erica lukes as you know and this is ufo classified and i want you to to make sure that you visit blue blurry lines to read the latest blog that was written by kurt collins roger glazelle has been uh, there as well and doing a lot of research uh, behind the scenes. This is an important article about Skinwalker Ranch and the Pentagon. Different revelations are, are coming out now. Chris Marks uh, did the interview with Kurt Collins and so it is really important to read, to share and to get information out there about this. Um, please go to ufoclassified.com to check out my website. Make sure you are, you know, send me messages, get in touch with me. I'll do my best to answer and we will try to get good people on the show and, and really shine a light on this. We will be right back. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Gee, it's so quiet. Too quiet. Terribly quiet. Awfully quiet. Do you have an hour to kill? Well, crank up those EVPs, spirit boxes, and walk the haunted halls of the unknown with UK's very own paranormal investigator, David Cook. You guys ready for this? The Ghostly Hour, live Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. And now, your mind. Come hear first-hand accounts of some of the most famous ghost sightings, photos, and videos from around the world. Skeptics, believers, and spirits both good and bad. Welcome, 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 welcome. The Ghostly Hour, hosted by David Cook. Live every Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. <laughs> One million miles till midnight. A story of timelines, artificial worlds, simulated races, and the galactic imprint. And the destiny of a blue world called Earth. One million miles till midnight. Written by Solaris Blue Raven. 
is a journey through the mind's eye, which allows the reader to surf a wave of technological and multidimensional intellect, revealing a bridge between conscious design and the truth. A multidimensional bleed-through awakens the world of artificial intelligence to set sail into the frontiers of a vast multiverse, morphing planets and terraforming ascended worlds beyond the linear programs of a fated race. One million miles till midnight will awaken, inspire, prepare and enlighten one to the many multidimensional states of consciousness and worlds we reside in. With every cell and atom, we are this truth and multiverse. One Million Miles Till Midnight. Written by Solaris Blue Raven. Available now at Amazon.com. Don't wait. Get your copy today. There is a world outside that which we live in. A realm where fact and fiction collide. The Paradigm Matrix. The Paradigm Matrix. Hosted by Willie Miranda. Every Friday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. The one-hour show that will surely leave you hanging on the edge of the rabbit hole. The Paradigm Matrix. Explores a universe of topics from UFOs, cryptozoology, conspiracies, as well as all things paranormal. Enter a world of the twisted and deformed. Friday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. The Paradigm Matrix. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Where fact and fiction collide. CCOR Digital Radio Network. I love the way it sounds. I love the music. Oh, I listen to you. The future of radio is here and now. One, the only. You're listening to. You are listening to. You're listening to. UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name, KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to the last segment of UFO Classified. As you all know, Friday nights are awesome because I get to spend them with you. And I have the most respectful and wonderful group of listeners in in chat when I post, when Northern UFOs post, uh, graciously my shows to YouTube, I have a majority of the people are asking very incredibly just great questions. And of course, we have the occasional troll because we're pushing the narrative with some of the new things that are coming out about Skinwalker and, and some of the questions that I've raised over the years about MUFON. But overall, there are lots of wonderful people out there who just want answers and are understanding that there is more to this than we are being told by people uh, that have a vested interest in steering the narrative. So anyway, thank you for your support. I am here with Dr. Angela Thompson Smith, and she is author of Voices from the Cosmos, Seer, Tactical Remote Viewing. She talked about these these books. You can go to Amazon uh, to get these and add them to your library. But, but um, and you were you were mentioning that there you you've got you're reworking one of your books, and you're going to be re-releasing that. And you've got some projects that you're going to work on this weekend too. Yes, um, I, I'm right at the end of formatting. Um, scribe that's the um, the sequel to my book seer which are all the cases I've worked on or most of the cases um, that I've worked on actually um, 30 or 40 years and um, I've thought it would be interesting to show you know up and coming remote viewers what's available um, so I got to do the formatting for Amazon uh, this weekend, probably, because I'm, I'm getting tired of it and I want to get it off my desk. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And, I love and it. And then I've been doing some, I've been going through the journals because um, I'm going to cannibalize um, Diary of an Abduction, which is out of print. It's still available secondhand on Amazon, which I don't get any money for. They're private sales. Um, and um, then I'm going to add in a whole bunch of stuff. So I've kind of got some ideas now working on that. So I'm always doing something. Some days I'm working hard and some days hardly working. I could, well, you know, that sounds good to me. That sounds Yes, about- yes. <laughs> and so I, this is something that I'm really excited to talk about. And you, you and I, you gave me some information about this, but with my research into everybody's favorite ranch, Skinwalker Ranch, I came across a, and I've got two different copies here in my hot little hands, but the remote view that you were commissioned to do. Mm-hmm. And the, the report was issued January 10th, 2003. But can you give us background on this and tell us who commissioned you and how this played out? Yeah. Um, of course, I had known... Um, we're over here, uh, um, George Knapp, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a frog in my throat, uh, from George, George Knapp from back in Bigelow days. And he contacted me in 2003 and said, um, mentioned a little bit about the Skinwalker Ranch. And I knew a little bit, very vaguely about it, only what had been put in the press. And the um, so I tried to stay as naive as possible when I'm doing a remote viewing so I don't bring in my own um, imaginations and um, expectations etc and he said well I've got some questions do you think you and some of the other remote viewers could do a project I went sure (laughs) Um, this was uh, like a based on a humanitarian uh, basis there was no funding for this Um, he he was just curious could the remote what could the remote viewers get so over um, a couple of weeks, I did my viewing first and because um, I, I don't want to be influenced by any other viewers once they start doing their work. And the viewers who come after don't know what I've done because I keep it all separate. So if you look at the report, Amethyst is my uh, name for that project. We all use pseudonyms for that. Um, and then I believe there were four or five other viewers that um, I contacted and we did it in three phases it was like you know what happened there what's happening now and what's it going to be like in five years so we did three separate uh, viewings Um, I think I was the only one who did the five years ahead one and um, a lot of very interesting data came in because these viewers all they got was a coordinate which was an alphanumeric like abc123 they got no other upfront information about the the ranch or what this was that it was a location or an event or anything and the view the information that came back was very pertinent to the ranch describing the location uh, lights in the sky um, a grid underneath the surface um a lot of very interesting information that there was quite possibly a military connection, that there was probably a Navy connection. Of course, all this was speculative and as the remote viewers were sending in their data, they were just not doing any analysis on it. This was just what they perceived. And then I put that into a report, which is available if people want to email me, uh, mindwiseconsulting.com. I can send them a copy of the report and it was then summarized for Hunt for the Skinwalker and it's in the uh, chapter called The Military uh, along with other remote viewers. I'm not quite sure. I think, um, um, I don't know who else was in there. It was So Juice is was in, in phase one, it was viewer yeah. number one. And, and it, it, have the identities of any of the viewers, have they ever come forward, or is that no? Something? They haven't. Okay. No. <laughs> that's yeah. and that's. I'm glad that yep, that's that's good. And so, and I wanted to say they in, could if they wanted to, um, because they got feedback on it, so they know that they were what they were eventually viewing. Yeah. 
And it, it, it's interesting because in the, the phase one, uh, the viewer number one, Juice, as I just mentioned, was mentioning that she picked up a, a sketch of a man lying face down on the ground. And and the, the quote is, the person uh, I had a very quick look at was laying face down while looking upward. He had, I think he had his hands behind his back. And then there was a sketch of a rectangular box that had smaller boxes stacked inside. They were made of cardboard uh, and sitting on a green table. And and so there was a, it's really fascinating uh, things that, that we're seeing, but most of, of which, I mean, when you look at the report, have to do, it, it don't necessarily have to do a lot with, with ET or different things. And there is in, in phase one as well, Scout, who was mentioning, and you mentioned this as well, an expansive metallic honeycomb-like surface, a man-made open space. Did you, I mean, what, what other, what were your perceptions about that? Um, well, I got the grid like there was something underground. There was a grid like um, something that was under the surface that was over the whole area. Um, and uh, I forget exactly. I'd have to go back because I've done so many, you know, <laughs> um, and reread it. But um, and then my fifth one, when I, when we were asked to go five years ahead, I perceived that there'd been a fire on the on the property, which I've been told since that there had been, um, and that the the, the um, control place, the very central place, wasn't at the time that I was viewing it. Five years from two thousand three, um, was abandoned for a while, and wasn't in use. So I I was told that that was the case so um you know very interesting we even got sketches which haven't were not in the um in the book and so did you with with the fire what were you told because there's very little information out there about the fire on the on the property well i've learned since that it was one of the the homesteads i i perceived it as a control place but um i've been told since it was a, a one of the homesteads Okay, and that's that's interesting. And and also, uh, one of the the viewers mentioned that there was a they perceived uh, a wild shaking, such as waves, and and I think that is is interesting, especially given you know the new TV show on the History Channel, and they're talking about different waves of of radiation that are moving over the ranch. And I wonder if that could be something that one of the viewers picked up. Yeah, sometimes energy like that can be picked up as a physical sensation. It's called aesthetic impact, and um, it can come in very much as a you know a physical uh, sensation. It's it's just fascinating to read through this, and uh, I mean I, I I mean what else what else you know after you got done with the the remote view and, and you gave it to Nap, and I think I believe Kelleher was in, involved in that, if I'm correct. Well, I've never met Kelleher or communicated with him, so um, I don't know. I'm sure he saw the report um, and then it made it into the book, you know, Hunt for the Skinwalker. Um, so I honestly don't know what his take on it was. And it, it, yeah, and it, that's fascinating. Was what, what, what was George's input when he read the report? Did he give he, you much feedback? He just thanked me. <laughs> he just said, thank you. Um, and I've never been up there. I mean, I would love to go up there sometime and see for myself. And I'm I'm not a fearful person. You know, I, I would be curious, very curious. What do, I mean, what do you, I mean, what what are your thoughts? I mean, your, your general feelings about the activity that takes place at the ranch? I know that's hard to to kind of throw you in there and but just your your perceptions or your I mean any anything that you have because I know that my thoughts and feelings about the ranch and the activities that took place there have definitely changed over the years. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just one thing. You can't just say yes, it's uh, you know um, Navajo, or it's not just military, or it's not just paranormal or it's not just something under the ground. It's not just one of those things um, exclusively. I think there's an intermesh of multiple uh, things going on there. 
and they have to be studied both individually and and together to make any sense. Absolutely. And when when you remote view a place that has a lot of UFO activity uh, or, or paranormal activity, what are some of the things, your perceptions that you uh, you have when when you're viewing them? Well, it depends on if I have any what's called front loading. Sometimes in a project, uh, some of them are totally blind, which means you, all you get is a, um, a coordinate and a, a dra- you know a code of case number. Um, and other times you're given a, some front loading. This is an event, describe the event, or this is a location, describe the location. Um, so it depends. Um, if it's a, I've had some personal experiences. So that kind of colors when I'm doing remote viewing because I've had some, you know, contact. Um, And uh, so sometimes I'll recognize, I'll go, oh yeah, here we go. Here's the guys, you know, Um, and I can describe them. And uh, I don't get tasked very often on ET UFO stuff, um, just from time to time. It's mostly um, other areas. And it's, 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 I, I would that would be very fascinating to know, which we will never know because you cited non-disclosure. Who the New York businessman? <laughs> I can't know. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. Um, but the agreement was I would Absolutely. never mention. I call him Jay in um, tactical remote viewing, but I, I decide I, I could never say his reveal his Absolutely. full name, his company, anything about his family or his business or his finances. No, absolutely. But yeah. it would be fascinating to know because there are uh, it's, it's some people that kind of move in this very quietly uh, and, and provide funding in different places. I'm not saying that, yeah. you know, that Jay did that, but it is interesting to, to find out some of the, the things that go on behind the scenes. Well, I, I later found out um, – and I'll tell you this real quick. Um, during our work together over the nine years, I often used to think, why is he wanting this information just for his company? This this applies to national security, you know? But I kind of set that aside because I, I didn't want to get paranoid. But then once we'd finished our contract and then he, he actually relocated and um, then he later passed away, I started doing some digging and he did have um, some strong government connections, government and military connections. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And that's written up in uh, tactical remote viewing. Oh, that is interesting. I can't wait just to, to spend a, a weekend, many weekends, and just dig into your books <laughs> and then have you back on the show because there, there's so many things that I want to ask you and, and little pieces of the puzzle that you have mentioned. And I want to go back to one thing that kind of struck my my fancy. You were talking about some of the work that you did for, for Bigelow and you. one of your tasks was that you were to... to um, to to help a library to archive to find data. Mhm. Mhm. Um, we had a filing system, so in those days, um, a lot of it was paper, uh, paper uh, reports. So I I amassed a a very a large collection of um, papers, scientific papers, etc., and reports and books, and also um, went to a lot of the secondhand stores, bookstores in Las Vegas and sent away uh, like Bodhi books, you know, and um, built up quite a library on anomalous topics for Mr. Bigelow. Oh, that's fascinating. I know that I've heard a couple of people over the years that have seen the library, and I'm sure that would be a fascinating, fascinating thing. Were there specific topics that he was more interested in at the time you were working with him? Um Parapsychology, um, the afterlife, reincarnation, um, alter- alternative—I mean, everything basically, just anything paranormal. Oh, how fascinating! Yeah. And, and so, since we've got about five minutes to, to show close, and I know that there are a couple of people in my my chat that want to know 
just, you know, very bluntly, what are your thoughts on remote viewing? Because some people have a hard time grasping or, or people have questions about it as, as yeah. you know, they should. So yeah. just, your- well, okay, this is a, a new, not a new thing. This has got um, multiple eons of predecession, you know, as, if that's a word. Um, it's been around under different terms for millions of years. It's a skill, it's an ability that everybody has to some degree. What the modern technology does, the modern techniques is um, it gives you a format to be able to tap into the subconscious more effectively and how to bring up information on certain topics. So I be- I really feel remote viewing works. I've proven it for myself. I have students actually teach remote viewing. I have total beginners here for weekend applications courses, putting remote viewing to work. And they're scoring around 75 to 78% across the board. Um, total beginners, as I do have other folks come in too, but even the beginners are getting um, good scores on this. Um, and anybody who has a question that they need to ask me, they can email me at mindwiseconsulting at gmail.com. And um, I can, you know, I'll be very happy to um, contact, you know, be in contact with them. And I also have a an Excel file of the ET interviews from Voices from the Cosmos that I'm, it's freely shareable. I'm very happy to send that out to anybody that contacts me. And that's wonderful. And I'm sure you will have people contact you after tonight. And are you, I know we had mentioned because, you know, the, the everything that's happening in the world right now and the fact that we've had to social distance and, and be careful of, of certain things. I know that that's kind of stopped. You were conferences that we were booked to speak at and mm-hmm. all of these things. But are you planning on uh, holding another training session? As soon as we're allowed. <laughs> okay. Yes. I, I. In fact, I've got students lined up waiting for courses. Um, I usually do the three day, three day master class, and then I also do an exobiology weekend, two classes, two days. So um, you know, as soon as um, we get the okay, then uh, I'll be back teaching. Well, that will be wonderful. And in the meantime, it sounds like you're going to be writing and, and occupying yourself. Uh-huh, keeping busy. <laughs> That's the only thing to do. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's never a dull moment. when it, This definitely, this time period is teaches you a lot about yourself. Yes. And, and some things are, are good and some things you just think, okay, well, back to the self-help books or something. I don't know. Right. <laughs> But it's so you're you're hopefully and I'll I'll make sure that when when things get on the schedule and you're doing a training that I will put that forward and I had mentioned you know just as a, one of my fantasies it would be so cool to get you up to Salt Lake you know with Paul Smith and we can maybe talk about that that would be oh, I'd love very, to. very interesting yeah. I would love that we have so many great people here in Salt Lake I know Benjamin Hyde is in 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 chat tonight and he's a yeah you know, he's on face he's a Facebook friend yes yeah so we've we've got really wonderful people in Utah and I love that and they would be in Tracy uh, Vega, another dear friend of mine from Utah. We've got some people that would be very supportive of that. And so we'll see what we can do in that regard. But with just with closing thoughts on life, anything deep? Um, just that nothing lasts forever. <laughs> so, you know, what the, we live in interesting times. Um, don't fret. Just, um, I think we're here to observe and learn, and I, I document. So I feel very much a scribe in the in these days. So I'm just observing and writing. In your life, you've been, you've had wonderful experiences, and you've been places and met fascinating people, and have have been uh, on the forefront of a lot of things. And so, what a wonderful contribution it's uh, it's been an amazing life I mean I'm you know getting up in years <laughs> but I feel I've got a long way to go I've got a lot still to learn and a lot to teach and um, 
I want to impart that information to other people. And I think that's wonderful. And you've been very kind to me and I appreciate that. I love, I love that. This has been a wonderful interview tonight. And again, just give uh, our listeners the, your, your web address so they can, they can send you messages and they will. So prepare right. yourself. Yeah. So they can contact me either through the website, which is um, mindwiseconsulting.com or directly to my email, which is um, mindwiseconsulting at, at uh, gmail.com. Thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show tonight. And again, I want to thank everybody for supporting the show and for listening. There is so much that is taking place right now. I know that I have not talked about the recent revelations from the Pentagon, but I will leave it up to lots of other people that have uh, things to say with regard to that and let you make your own decisions on that. But you know that I've definitely learned with research, especially as of late, that we should question all of this. And perhaps is that uh, another red herring? Is there something more going on? Yes, there probably might be. So do your due diligence uh, with regard to that and make sure you just understand that the, the, Make sure, make sure again. I wanted to stress this, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of tripping over myself tonight. This is me trying to get my business uh, rebooted again. But just make sure that you understand that social media is definitely manipulated. People have a vested interest in steering that, and so just try to disconnect every once in a while and go out and garden or uh, hang out with your friends, do things. Well, actually, in a mask, six feet apart. Who am I kidding? But. <laughs> Or on Zoom, whatever you need to do, but just enjoy life and and decompress and don't get too caught up in the world of ufology or or any of this. It is it's important, but there are other things. And I think I just gave myself a lecture for the evening. So thank you all for, ah. for listening. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much all of you and thank you for being on the show this has been wonderful well, thank you for having me on the show absolutely we'll talk very very soon okay. and uh, all of you have a wonderful evening stick around for a great night on KCOR Tina Marie you rock you are the best and I will catch you next week listen very carefully this is here to again please <laughs> This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, Visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack.